Hi, I'm Petty Officer Christina Brockman. Join Staff Sergeant Jimmy Williams and me on Navy Marine Corps News. This week, sailors aboard USS Haas rushed to the aid of their shipmates aboard USS Cole, who survived the blast in Yemen last month. Sailors and Marines pay a visit to Split Croatia to conduct amphibious training with the Croatian Navy and Army. And we'll show you how the Navy and Marine Corps are lending a helping hand in building the space station. These stories and more on Navy Marine Corps News. This week on Navy Marine Corps News, sailors aboard USS Hawes rushed to the aid of their shipmates aboard USS Cole, who survived the blast in Yemen last month. Sailors and Marines pay a visit to split Croatia and train in an amphibious exercise with the Croatian Navy and Army. And we'll show you how the Navy and Marine Corps are lending a helping hand in building the space station. These stories and more next on Navy Marine Corps News. Good afternoon, my name is Andre Fletcher. We are the students from H.D. Woodson Senior High School, NJROTC. We are touring the USS Falcon. Stay tuned for more Navy Marine Corps news. Welcome to Navy Marine Corps News. I'm Staff Sergeant Jimmy Williams. And I'm Petty Officer Christina Brockman. It's been more than a month since the explosion aboard USS Cole took the lives of 17 of our shipmates. USS Haas was sailing to the Mediterranean Sea from the Arabian Gulf when they heard the news. Seaman Jennifer Smith has more. We got the word off of the coast of uh, Oman and when we heard it over the radio that she had taken a blast and before we were even uh, directed to proceed, we both came to, you know, both throttles went to max uh, speed and we came down here and we couldn't get here quick enough. And because of that, the Haas crew was able to help immediately. I, I, lines of people. We want to go to the coal and help out. But I said, then we all can't go over there because it's just, there's a, uh, just the way the, the situation is over there, they couldn't take a lot of people on board to do things. But I said, I'll tell you what we can do for them though, is they have a lot of nothing in terms of a ship store and ability to buy things. We sold out our ship store by putting it in boxes and, and taking over, you know, everything from candy bars to, uh, uh, you know, personal habitability items. The Haas crew sent more than just ship store items to their shipmates on the coal. They also got to use our email and our sailor phone, which I think was the biggest help of all. USS Coal sailors appreciated the support of their Haas shipmates. Uh, myself, I got to go over to the ships, take a nice hot shower, nice, nice hot meal. And they treat me like, like their own. Everybody here is definitely connected now for the, for the rest of their lives. Um, I'm sure people will be in contact with each other for till now, until the time that they die, from their kids to their grandkids. Uh, this will go down in history. It'll be in the history books. In addition to the support from the crew of the USS Hawes, sailors from the coal are also thankful for the support they received from their families back home. I say to my wife, thank you for being strong for me. I appreciate the words of encouragement, and we'll be home soon. Seaman Jennifer Smith, Navy Marine Corps News. It's great to see how shipmates pull together. I guess that's what the Navy Marine Corps team is all about. Absolutely. Now, at the end of that story, you saw Petty Officer Jones promise his family that he'd be home soon. And in the beginning of November, he and 216 of his shipmates made good on that promise, returning to a hero's welcome in Norfolk. Family members waited anxiously as the chartered flight carrying their loved ones touched down and the coal sailors made their way off the plane. For the returning sailors, it was an emotional moment. I have never been so proud to be an American and to land on American soil. <laughs> we all burst into, into applause and start screaming when we hit ground here. The coal sailors say they counted on each other during the crisis. We knew we had to get stuff done. We got it done. Um, we knew we had to get all of our shipmates off that were injured, and, and we got them off as fast as possible, and then maintained on getting the ship staying afloat, and we did it. But their loved ones back home say they counted on the Navy family in the days after the explosion. They kept us informed. Um, they have been a true family, you know, more than we have ever expected. Absolutely wonderful. People all over the country have continued to express their support for the sailors and family members of USS Cole. 
Just before Game 4 of the World Series, Major League Baseball honored the Cole, sharing the stage with five of her sailors. Chief Tom Cradell was there. The 55,000 fans were on hand to watch Game 4 of the World Series between the Mets and Yankees. But just before the first pitch, they cheered for the five USS Cole sailors on hand as baseball's guests. It's our privilege and our pleasure. Uh, they've represented our country so magnificently and I'm all of baseball and I think all of America felt so badly what happened that this is the least that we could do and frankly it is our honor to have them here. The sailors joined singer Cheryl Crow on the field for the national anthem. They say the event wasn't just for them, it was for all their shipmates. I feel very proud. I'm, I'm glad to know that uh, our service is not forgotten, that we are uh, remembered. Uh, people do appreciate what we do. To get recognized, you know, for, for those that we have lost is a, a true blessing. After the anthem, the players sat with baseball commissioner Bud Selig in his field box to enjoy the game. From Shea Stadium in New York, Chief Tom Cardell, Navy Marine Corps News. Just as Major League Baseball honored Cole sailors, so did the sport of auto racing. In the wake of the Cole bombing, one NASCAR driver took it upon himself to express his thoughts during a recent truck race. Petty Officer Chris Robinson of our San Diego Bureau brings us the story. By most accounts, Mike Wallace has had a successful NASCAR Truck Series season. He won two races and had 13 top five finishes. But by his estimate, his season wasn't as important as the lives lost aboard USS Cole. So for the final race of the season, he wanted to send a message to those aboard the destroyer. It was kind of an opportunity. I told my wife, I said, you know, we're, I'd like to put someone in the back of the truck just to say, hey, in memory of or thank you very much. His tribute came during the California 200 when he removed the team sponsor's name and dedicated the truck and the race to Cole sailors. And then it was time to race. Wallace started the race eighth and climbed up the fifth before the engine gave out. And though the team's day ended early, their feelings toward the military remain. We believe in our armed forces and we hate for stuff like that to happen and to be able to uh, do some kind of honor to these uh, 17 uh, people was uh, really grateful for Ultra Motorsports. We appreciate everything that, that the Navy does, the military does. We don't realize at times how fortunate we are. We get to come play with our race cars, do anything we want, come and go like there's nothing, you know, no big deal. Well, really, there's somebody defending this country for us that allows us to do that. From Fontana, California, Petty Officer Chris Robinson, Navy Marine Corps News. We'd like to give all service members an important reminder. Now is a good time to make sure your emergency contact information in your service record is updated. Check with your local PSD or admin office to make sure yours is correct. Well, it's time for our first break, but don't go away because when we return, we'll visit with Navy and Marine Corps officers preparing for a life as astronauts. Hello, shipmates, Mick Von Hurt here. There will be hundreds of ceremonies across America this week recognizing the great sacrifices of over two centuries of American heroes. They come from all races and ethnic backgrounds present in America, and they all had the same driving cause, an unswerving belief in freedom. More recently, our shipmates on the USS Cole fought so heroically to save their ship and their shipmates for that same belief in freedom. They served with every ounce of honor, courage, and commitment that anyone could possibly expect. It's up to us now to carry on fighting for the cause of freedom. The world relies on us to pay the bill for a way of life that every human being deserves. What better cause exists for a team to expend its efforts than freedom? We have been, we are, and we will continue to be the best team in the world. Let us never forget the coal. God bless you, and I'll see you about the fleet. of our nation. Courage. We have many traditions. In my career, I've experienced most of them. Commitment. However, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for our greatest tradition of all. Honor, sir. Movies aren't the only place you find heroes. Let the journey continue. 
Every day I see needless suffering and injury from traffic crashes caused by driving too fast. Each year, hundreds of thousands of people are critically injured. Many become disabled for life. Many die. Don't fool yourself. Speed shatters life. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. These are challenging times for military recruiters. With the booming economy, convincing America's youth to join the service is a full-time job. But the Marine Corps isn't having any trouble. As Petty Officer Michael Gleckler reports, Marine recruiters are doing a great job meeting their goals. They don't promise you a rose garden. Push up, push up, push up. And even though the recruiters pull no punches explaining what boot camp is like, they are consistently keeping the squad bays and parade decks full with eager recruits. Marine Corps Commandant General James Jones was in San Diego recently to present the 12th recruiting district with a Navy unit commendation. The command has met its goal every month for over five years. A remarkable streak and one which begs the question, what is the Marine Corps doing right? Do they have great recruiters or is the Corps just an easy sell? We've developed a good message, uh, and we have great messengers. Uh, and I think you have to have both if you're going to be successful in recruiting. Spend some time with the recruiters themselves, and they'll tell you that the Marine Corps image goes a long way with kids. The idea of a challenge plays better with young people than money and benefits. One of the first things we say is if you're looking for money, this, is, this isn't the place you want to go. It's more about what we have to offer for, for yourself, you know. After all that money's gone, what's left? Just you and your abilities. And that's what the Marine Corps works on is your personal abilities. The chance to improve themselves, the chance to call themselves Marines, is why these recruits join. But for a kid still in high school, does a recruiter really explain how challenging it can be? Absolutely we do. And, and I, I think that maybe one out of every maybe 15 applicants will we'll probably lose them, you know, because we show them the reality. Um, right after they take a, a screening test, we show them the video, you know, we show them boot camp. Um, it, it's real people, real drill instructors, real yelling going on. And, you know, they're, they're a little hesitant at first, but that's really why they walk through the door. You know, they want that challenge. They hear that boot camp is hard, you know, and, and that's why we're talking to them to begin with. You know, they, they, they approach us for that. It's not going to be fun, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. And I know what I want to do in life, and I guess the Marine Corps is my stepping stone. Petty Officer Mike Gleckler, Navy Marine Corps News. Sailors from USS Austin and Marines of the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit, Special Operations Capable, recently paid a port visit to split Croatia. And while they were there, they took the time to train with the Croatian Navy and Army. The exercise was called Croatian Fiblex 2000. Petty Officer Nikki Maxwell has the details. The exercise involves amphibious assault drills, live fire training, and special forces operations. It's good to get out and train with other countries. I'm part of a recon team that's going to conduct pre-reconnaissance for a BLS landing for a golf company. Uh, they're landing uh, Zodiacs, so we're going to go check things out, check the objective out, and uh, send back reports. I'm the communicator for our team. I'll be operating SATCOM, uh, making sure comms up at all times. The reconnaissance information received from the Air Operations Mission was essential when planning the next event of the exercise, an amphibious assault on nearby Jerge Island. Like any international exercise, there were some challenges to overcome. I'm a landing signalman enlisted. I direct all the aircraft coming in and leaving. Uh, it's a little different because, you know, Americans are used to our signals and stuff like that, and now we got new people to teach so they can learn how we operate out here. Uh, I feel it's a new uh, landmark for the Navy to bring more people and organizations into our, our organization with us so we can all work together at once. The cooperative training between the Americans and Croatians allowed them to share military knowledge and professional skills. The air, land, and sea operations benefited each country and their future military strategy. But it also gave them something even more valuable, a better understanding of each other. I wanted to get out of it of knowing their counterparts. That's what it's all about, people knowing people. If they know people as Croatians and don't just see them as, you know, a country of Croatia, but they know people from Croatia, and they know that those people from Croatia are just like they are. That's probably the most important thing that they can get out of, because when they see something or they hear something, they realize, no, that's not true, I was there. I, I operated with these people, they're, they're, they're good people, they're just like we are. 
Croatia is a Partnership for Peace member and is actively seeking membership in NATO. Reporting from the USS Austin in the Adriatic Sea, Petty Officer Nikki Maxwell, Navy Marine Corps News. One of the exciting parts of being sailors and Marines is that we travel just about everywhere in the world. And as Petty Officer Miranda Williams of our San Diego Bureau tells us in our next story, there are some sailors and Marines who even travel out of this world. Right now, some 220 miles above the Earth's atmosphere, a sailor is making history. He is one of the first inhabitants of the International Space Station, beginning permanent human presence in space. I think the space station is going to be uh, vitally important, really, to the whole world for a, a lot of reasons. One, it's an international effort. There's 14 nations all coming together. It's also a research platform so we can understand more about the human body, so we can heal uh, problems down here on Earth uh, with the things that we learned from space. Construction in orbit of the ISS began in November 1998, and NASA sailors and Marines have been a big part of that process. Currently I'm training for my next space flight, which is STS-97, uh, which will launch in November of 2000. I will actually be doing two, maybe three spacewalks. It's hard to describe how much I'm looking forward to this because I've been training for it for almost three years and the opportunity to go step outside and do a spacewalk is something that uh, I've wanted to do uh, well, as long as I can think of. For some of these sailors and Marines, that dream began long ago. I can't imagine somebody my age watching guys land on the moon and not dreaming about being an astronaut. Um, that was, to me, though, sort of like being a, a quarterback in the Super Bowl. Others found their dream during their military journey. I started out when I was three years old. I wanted to be a pilot. That was my dream from the very beginning. Uh, so I joined the Navy, and then uh, after flying with the Navy and going to test pilot school, flying F-14s, I applied to NASA. From the day they arrive at Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, astronauts train continuously and learn important skills like land survival. I'm, I just want to check okay. 15, 16, 17, right? Scuba diving. Well, maybe the and spacesuit operation. Because there is so much to learn, astronauts wait at least two years to be assigned their first mission. The whole thing is just amazing. I loved every minute of it. From sitting on the pad and kind of waiting there, little butterflies in your stomach, the engines start and everything's shaking, and the next thing you know, you're rocketing into space. Once you're up there looking out and back at the Earth, how beautiful it is, it's just a tremendous thrill to be a part of. They are also thrilled to be sailors and Marines. It's easy for us to feel a little isolated from the Navy and the Marine Corps being here at NASA because it's a relatively small Navy presence and uh, we think about those folks that are spending a lot of time overseas and deployed now doing the hard jobs so that we can uh, do our job here and, and not worry about it. So it's, uh, we appreciate all the efforts of the folks that are out there uh, away from their families doing the hard jobs at sea and on land. Although they are no longer serving on ships or overseas, these dedicated sailors and Marines are proud to represent their service and their country from the oceans of space. From Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, Petty Officer Miranda Williams, Navy Marine Corps News. President Clinton recently signed into law the fiscal year 2001 National Defense Authorization Act, giving the Defense Department a budget of more than $309 billion. Some of the benefits you'll see include a 3.7% pay raise, TRICARE changes, and military modernization. Service members in pay grades E5 to E7 will receive a targeted one-time monthly raise of $32 to $59 beginning July 1st. Well, it's time for another break, but don't go away. When we return, we'll see what the Navy is doing to help its sailors become more financially aware. Hi, I'm Mike Wallace, driver of the number two Team ASE Ford F-150 on the Craftsman Truck Series, and you're watching the Navy Marine Corps News. All right, keep your eyes on the watch. You are getting very sleepy. Your eyelids are getting very heavy. And soon you will be under my control, my complete control. Now I want you to focus. I want you to clear your mind. You are alone in this room, just you and the November Hollands. On the surface, you are very interested in the pictures it holds. But as we dig deeper, much deeper, you are captured by the stories that tell of this thing called the fleet. You are gripped by the engaging stories. You feel yourself wanting to be a sea bee in paradise. Now concentrate. Imagine it is you that is biking across America, 
Can you feel the wind in your face? When I count to three, you will come out of your deep sleep and become one with the November all hands. You will be one with the fleet. But first, quack like a duck. <laughs> I love that part. Don't keep your friends and family waiting. Get your holiday mail out early. Here are the dates for delivery to U.S. addresses. Parcel airlift and space aid by December 8th and air letters by December 11th. For delivery to APO and FPO addresses, parcel airlift and space aid by December 4th and air letters by December 11th. Don't let your family down. Get your holiday mail out early. Welcome back to Navy Marine Corps News. Sometimes sailors and Marines are tempted to live beyond their means. And that's why the Navy is launching new initiatives to show sailors how to get the most out of their money. Petty Officer Katherine Anderson of our Norfolk Bureau has the story. Personal financial management has always been an important part of any sailor's career. But now, sailors will get initial training in boot camp and follow-on training in A school, Petty Officer Indoctrination, leadership continuum, and even at the CPO Academy. By budgeting in time throughout their career, the Navy hopes to produce a financially informed sailor. And that also includes providing formally trained personal financial specialists at the command level. They go out and do GMTs for the sailors, divisional training, and they also do the same sorts of training, um, checkbook management, car buying, consumer awareness. The program is good because it helps you do power payments on small bills that you are trying to get rid of. From their command specialist, sailors can also receive a new interactive CD-ROM. A budget! Featuring Bob the host. Ah, who needs one? You do. Pro football player Ronnie Lott as the narrator. To hang on to your dough. And even a fairy godmother to help them through. Now you have a budget. And even with all of these resources, the experts say the best way to plan for a financially secure future is to put yourself on the payroll. You are the most important person when it comes to your money. So if you get into the habit of paying yourself 10% of your paycheck every month, you begin to build that foundation. And the financial management skills you learn will help you manage your work tasks better too. Petty Officer Katherine Anderson, Navy Marine Corps News. Smokers have 10 times the risk of getting lung cancer and twice the risk of dying from heart disease than non-smokers. Smoking can interfere with the healing of wounds and fractures, and it increases facial wrinkling, making a person look older than he or she really is. Seaman Jennifer Smith talks about why you should quit smoking and when might be a good time to kick the habit. November 16th is the Great American Smokeout. It's a day when smokers who have thought about quitting smoking can take their first step. But just in case you don't think you're ready, here's a few reminders of why you should. A higher increase of sinusitis in that, and then in the later years, like when people are gonna retire in that, um, coming down with lung cancer, um, other type of cancers related to it. This is about a year's worth of tar. This is what a person actually ingests as they're smoking a cigarette. There is another reason other than health to quit. When people go out and buy a pack of cigarettes, uh, it's not that much. But then when I show them a chart of a day, a week, a month, and a year, and they start seeing like $1,000, they start thinking, do I really want to spend that much? But cigarettes aren't the only nicotine health risk. Smokeless chewing tobacco is just as cancerous, if not more. The thing that people don't understand with like mouth cancer is when they find just a little speck in their mouth, they remove three centimeters around it. Whether it's teeth, gum, bone, cheek, they take it out of there. So you know the negatives and you're thinking about quitting. Naval medical facilities can help you get off the habit. We have medication, we have patches, and we do the counseling, which is the most important thing. Yeah, I know it's not easy. I'm a smoker too. But don't you think a healthier lifestyle is worth 24 hours? I do. Seaman Jennifer Smith, Navy Marine Corps News. Sailors getting ready to transfer to a new duty station will want to check out Cyber Sailor. This week, Airman Chris Reynolds shows you where to go to look for that new set of orders. 
bupers.navy.mil is the Navy's personnel command website where you can get connected to information on pay, uniform matters, and most other administrative type issues. Among these links is one which all sailors will find useful, Bupers Access. Access is an online jazz viewing site where you can see the current available job openings in your rate. View only jazz is not available to see every day, but you'll find a calendar that shows you what days you can view it highlighted in green. Bupers Access also lets you submit an online duty preference form. Here, you can pick the top three locations where you would like to be stationed. You can also request extensions and Navy schools. Access saves you time because it eliminates doing this work with your detailer. Plus, the jazz is frequently updated, so all jobs are current. When you're done, you can return to the Bupers homepage to check out some of the other services it offers. Under Services, you can connect to the Defense, Finance, and Accounting Service to see the current military pay chart, as well as information on other money matters. Click on Detailers to get the phone number of your detailer for those times when you do need to talk to him or her. You can also read about what's going on in your job field. The Newsstand button takes you to various online Navy magazines for informative articles on current issues. Bupers Access and Bupers.Navy.mil are both great resources. They're easy to use and very convenient, so take advantage of them. If you have any questions or if there are any other sites you'd like me to share with the fleet, Send them to cybersailor at mediasend.navy.mil. I'm Airman Chris Reynolds, Navy Marine Corps News. Well, that's the show for this week. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts and ideas about Navy Marine Corps News. So call our feedback line or send us an email. The number and address are coming up in a minute. But before we go, we'd like to say BZ to HM3 Gladys Jen of Naval Hospital Cherry Point, North Carolina. She was recently presented with one of six Distinguished Women of Craven County Awards. She's involved with numerous charity organizations, such as Meals on Wheels, Habitat for Humanity, and Toys for Tots. Good job. We'd also like to say hello and thanks for watching to our viewers in Grove, Oklahoma, who see us each week on WEF TV Channel 43. As we celebrate Veterans Day, we like to end the show by reflecting on those who have served our country. We leave you this week with a special look at people commemorating veterans right here at Monuments in our nation's capital. Until next week. Take care. It makes you think of the people that died and then the wall, just the faded pictures makes it more emotional. You look at the names and, and uh, there's so many of them. I guess if you're in the Navy, you just got to see it, <laughs> you know? I felt like I was contributing. I was meeting people from all over the country. I was serving, I was helping out. I loved it. Without the veterans, there wouldn't be the freedom in the United States that we have today. I love you, brothers. Every one of you. Just remember. In Split, Croatia, the seventh port visit of their Mediterranean cruise, the sailors of the USS Austin and Marines from the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit participated with the Croatian Army's 4th Brigade and Naval Forces in an amphibious exercise called Croatian Biblex 2000. The exercise involves amphibious assault drills, live fire training, and special forces operations. It's good to get out and train with other countries. I'm part of a recon team that's going to conduct pre-reconnaissance for a BLS landing for a golf company. Uh, they're landing uh, Zodiacs, so we're going to go check things out, check the objective out, and uh, send back reports. I'm the communicator for our team. I'll be offering SATCOM, uh, making sure comms up at all times. 
The reconnaissance information received from the Air Operations Mission was essential when planning the next event of the exercise, an amphibious assault on nearby Jergue Island. Like any international exercise, there were some challenges to overcome. I'm a landing signalman enlisted. Uh, I direct all the aircraft coming in and leaving. Uh, it's a little different because, you know, Americans are used to our signals and stuff like that, and now we got new people to teach so they can learn how we operate out here. Uh, I feel it's a new uh, landmark for the Navy, bring more people, more organizations into our, our organization with us so we can all work together as one. The cooperative training between the Americans and Croatians allowed them to share military knowledge and professional skills. The air, land, and sea operations benefited each country and their future military strategy. But it also gave them something even more valuable, a better understanding of each other. I wanted to get out of it of knowing their counterparts. That's what it's all about, people knowing people. If they know people as Croatians, and don't just see them as, you know, a country of Croatia, but they know people from Croatia, and they know that those people from Croatia are just like they are. That's probably the most important thing that they can get out of, because when they see something or they hear something, they realize, no, that's not true. I was there. I, I operated with these people. They're, they're, they're good people. They're just like we are. Croatia is a Partnership for Peace member and is actively seeking membership in NATO. Reporting from the USS Austin in the Adriatic Sea, Petty Officer Nikki Maxwell, Navy Marine Corps News. Throughout the 16 weeks of OCS, enlisted leadership has an incredible influence on the officer candidates. Marching. Hurt, hurt, hurt. Basic seamanship. Passing. Two, two, zero. And damage control. We use banding material to secure. Are just a few of the things these enlisted men and these enlisted men and women teach to help shape the future leaders of the Navy. The senior enlisted leadership in the Navy is uh, the backbone of the Navy. They they run the Navy leaving the management to the officers, and uh, we respect that, and they have a lot to teach. So, at 310, you should have ordered, shift your rudder. We get to learn as officers from someone who's been out in the fleet that has been there uh, turning the wrenches. The most easily recognized figure at OCS is the Marine Corps drill instructor. The Marine Corps uh, drill instructors, they have such a strong sense of honor and commitment to their corps, and um, I think the Navy really wanted to instill that in their officers. These committed Marines mold these candidates into naval officers. They fill many roles. Sometimes dad, mom, big brother, all in one. A drill instructor would probably be, in general, a father, except a very, very intense father. And they say the rewards of all this hard work are endless. Best part of being a drone sergeant is seeing the finished product, getting, getting candidates in, in the beginning, see what they start out like, and watch them cross parade deck as ensigns. The dedication George shows. The drone instructor is probably one of the most impressive persons in this entire school. I want you to sit up straight, keep your hands away from your face, feet flat on the deck, but I do want you to relax and I want you to ask questions. Is that understood? Yes, sir! Drill instructor. Yes, sir. He's actually an amazing man. Uh, when we first get here, you learn to hate the guy. And he's, he's very intense, and you don't know what to expect, but it's amazing the transformation you go through in a short amount of time, and it's all his influence. These weeks of training go beyond the parade deck, the grinders, and classrooms. Every once in a while, the candidates get to experience life at sea. What we do is we instruct them in the classroom in theories of seamanship and navigation and then actually bring them out on the vessel to uh, reinforce those theories of what they learned in the classroom and actually allow them to put those theories into practical application. Steer new course 050. Hands-on training like this isn't limited to the yard patrol boats. Candidates also learn basic damage control in real life situations. They are going to be the future leaders of the Navy, and as a leader, if they have never seen this stuff, then it's kind of hard to lead people in an emergency type situation to get them to do what they need to do. These candidates also recognize the importance of this training. It's important because many of the officer candidates here are going to be reporting to ships for the first time. It's very important that all individuals on the ship know how to do this type of uh, 
uh, damage control. You're going to salute the ensign. The officer of the deck will return that salute. The chiefs are here to instruct. The added benefit is the officer candidates experience the relationship between the wardroom and the chief's mess. We try and instill in the candidates from the beginning that the chiefs are the ones that are going to make them successful out in the fleet. Reporting from Pensacola, Florida, Petty Officer Nico Melendez, Navy Marine Corps News. They have been called the greatest generation. The millions of Americans who served in the military and the civilians on the home front during World War II. This Veterans Day, 10,000 veterans, their families, and many dignitaries gathered on the National Mall for a long-awaited ceremony to break ground on the National <laughs> World War II Memorial. Among the dignitaries was President Bill Clinton. With this memorial, we secure the memory of 16 million Americans, men and women who took up arms in the greatest struggle humanity has ever known. We hallow the ground for more than 400,000 who never came home. We acknowledge a debt that can never be repaid. The site is located on the National Mall, between the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Monument. It will stand both as a remembrance of family and friends who served but also as a lesson for future generations. From Guadalcanal to Omaha Beach, the millions of Americans who changed the course of civilization itself will have their names etched in the book of history in a far more profound and permanent way. This memorial is built not only for the children whose grandparents served in the war, but for the children who will visit this place a century from now, asking questions about America's great victory for freedom. The memorial is expected to be dedicated on Memorial Day 2003. Corporal Jimmy Perkins, Navy Marine Corps News. Skimming over the ocean towards USS Juno's flight deck, the Marine CH-46 is ready to land. The pilot waits for the signal from the sailor on deck and then lands only to take off and repeat the cycle. Uh, we were doing carrier qualifications. We were basically going around the pattern and uh, landing, preparing the, the air crew, uh, make sure that they're able to land on a small deck. For this to work, everyone has to work together. The crew in the helo with the personnel in flight deck control. And in the middle of all this is Airman Shane Wilson, who directs the helo. You got, you got a radio on with um, the air boss right behind you telling you what to do up in the tower. Everybody's yelling in your radio, telling you what to do. So you kind of just got to listen, know where the helo needs to be, and put it down. Flying the pattern, landing, and then taking off again is essential practice for both the Marines and sailors who are part of the forward deployed amphibious force. Having the capability to move troops from a shipboard platform day or night in any weather is what we're practicing for and, and what we hope to get. The Flying Tigers of HMM-262 departed Juno following a port visit to Hong Kong to participate in Exercise Full Eagle aboard USS Essex. Navy journalist Rob Schmelke, Fleet Activity Sasebo, Japan. dedicated to doing a good job. But after working hours, he's ready to forget about the day's worries and cut loose. For me, anyway, it helped the deployment go by so fast that it was like nothing. It was fun. It made it, it, made it that much fun. And he's not alone. Many sailors across the Navy, including me sailors on board USS Abraham Lincoln, are strumming away their free time in off-duty bands. There's nothing more satisfying to the soul and picking up your guitar and you know putting down a couple of licks and just relieving the stress that you, know, you might go through during the day. Keeping a band going is challenging. 
challenging, but these sailors say it's worth it in the end. It's hard. We all stand different watches, different times. You know, there's days that we'll only get to practice an hour and maybe not practice at all. Judging from the support they get, their love of music is contagious. The MWR is actually helping us out, trying to set us up with different gigs. Um, and when we pull into port, it really helps our morale a lot. And it helps the morale of you know, the other people on the ship that we'll play for. Just the fact that I've been able to fulfill one of my fantasies to play on stage in, in a club, but this outlet here has allowed me to, to fulfill that fantasy. <laughs> It's through the, through the Navy that I was able to do that. Whether it's a dream or just a hobby, these passionate sailors are dedicated to making their bands work. From USS John C. Stennis and USS Abraham Lincoln, Petty Officer Miranda Williams, Navy Marine Corps News. Team Marines returned to the Homestead Miami Speedway for this year's final race, just one day after the Marine Corps birthday. The number 53 car sported a different paint scheme celebrating the occasion. But whether it's red, white, and blue, or just red or black, the number 53 car attracts a lot of attention from Marines nationwide. Well, it seems like it is because 98% of them that come and talk to me say, hey, that's our car. You gotta do good in our car. So, they don't refer to it as my car anymore, it's, it's the Marines car, and, and I just happen to be the driver. Joking aside, Hank Parker Jr. knows he's also part of the Marine team. It seems like they've really accepted me with open arms. But it's this man and his desire to give back to the Marine Corps who's made Team Marines possible. There's a lot of former Marines, a lot of present Marines that are really behind this program and appreciate what we're doing. And it really all boils down to honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. And that's real, the real deal. And there's just so many of us out there that all feel the same way about this. The Marine Corps does not sponsor Rick Rathman's Team Marines Racing because that's against the government's general ethics code. But the Marine Corps can buy advertising space on the car and team uniforms. And recruiting officials say the idea has paid off. The message coming in from our recruiting station commanders out in the field is this is a fabulous program and we want to continue to do it. And we hope to do so in the 2001 season. It's called McCree, the Marine Corps Combat Readiness Evaluation, a test to make sure these highly trained Marines have all the crucial skills they need before deployment. It's not only the individual skills of the Marines, but the skills of the, the team as a whole. And if you can't work as a team, then you're not going to be able to complete any of these tasks. The evaluation covers everything from live fire exercises to a full-on ground assault. And while Marines around the world participate in McCree, two, three Marines are getting a little extra help from Marine Air Ground Task Force 3. We are here supporting them. If they didn't have us, they'd be humping it or using trucks. So we're pretty much helping them, supporting them, working together. The MAGTAF acts as a conductor, coordinating all the different elements, from communications and logistics to air and ground support. Fire. Each unit helps give these motivated devil dogs a more realistic combat scenario. When you do a McCree, usually it's bits and pieces, but when you can get away, and you, like we've done here, we got everybody together, all different combat elements together, we're in one spot, and we can just concentrate and focus on what we're doing. And by helping ensure 2-3's combat readiness, each supporting element also gains valuable training. You get to see how everything's put into a play, and how everything falls in, and uh, working along with the other Marines and whatnot, you get to see uh, how teamwork is the way things should be. And you can't do it alone. You always need someone else. After proving they've got what it takes, these warriors know that together they can face any battle. From Puhakaloa Training Area, Hawaii, Petty Officer Laura Castro, Navy Marine Corps News.
From the Boston Massacre to Desert Storm in Bosnia, black Americans have and continue to serve in defense of this nation's founding principles. These patriots included 186,000 black Americans who donned the Union blue to serve on battlefields and in ships. Admiral Moore was on hand at the Navy Memorial the for a ceremony to honor African American Navy. Civil War sailors. The ceremony included a traditional wreath laying. Oh! But its main purpose was to unveil a new database at www.civilwar.nps.gov. Here, you can learn about these sailors, their contributions, and their struggles. Most importantly, they served faithfully and well in the process helping to destroy slavery as well as to save the Union. This database is the result of several years of research by Dr. Reedy and a team from Howard University. The research was made more difficult because the Navy was relatively desegregated for its day. Black sailors served on ships with their white counterparts, so researchers couldn't just look up an all-black unit. They had to go ship by ship, sailor by sailor. Howard one man University. in attendance carried the photo of right. one of his two great-grandfathers who served in the Civil War. He says he has an idea of what they'd say if they were here today. He'd be pretty impressed. I think he'd be, he'd be pleased for himself, probably for his mates, and for the country. The information on each sailor varies, but usually includes their ship, rate, and dates of service. Chief Tom Cridell, Navy Marine Corps News. Thank you for the inspirational example that you set every day, and thank you for sending us such wonderful young men and women uh, to start out their future and help keep our Navy number one. The Chief of Naval Personnel and Commander of Navy Recruiting were on hand to honor the 28 awardees. They received awards in several areas of recruiting, including enlisted, officer, and reserve recruiters of the year. I believe that it's important that we recognize the hard work that they're doing because they truly are making a difference. They're manning the Navy of the 21st century. An important task, and one the Navy's 5,000 recruiters take very seriously. No, I don't really feel I did anything special. I feel that the men and women that um, work for me or work under me, they're the ones that really did everything special. Many recruiters serve in their hometowns. One awardee says he became a recruiter because he wanted to give young people the chance to achieve their goals. The Navy provided me an opportunity to grow as a person in the and I, I wanted to return that to my community and uh, prove them that you don't have to be a basketball star and make millions of dollars to be a role model. Most of the awardees say putting qualified men and women in our Navy is reward enough, but now they'll hold their heads a little higher as they go about that task, knowing the Navy recognizes them as one of the best. Seaman Jennifer Smith, Navy Marine Corps News.